Well, we are very, 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 very happy to have John Armstrong here to demonstrate this. I know I'm interested. I watched several videos just to get some idea, to get some idea of what it's all about, even though I have a whole drawer full of this stuff that I've never used. And I'm sure there's several people that have done the same thing. So I'm really looking forward to this. So, John, with no further ado. Thank you. Welcome all, including you Zoomers out there. I'm going to demonstrate the equipment used for airbrushing. I'm going to go through the air airbrushing stuff with you. And for those of you who are here, not out in Zoom land, and welcome to you Zoomers. Uh, the signs that you saw coming in on the door, the signs that we have the arrows on showing us that wood turners are in this direction, those are all airbrushed that I did years ago. My background in airbrush, airbrush was to correct or Photoshop per se, today's language, photos and transparencies 40 years ago, maybe, when it was done with uh, dyes and scratch it off and put emulsion back on and everything else that way uh, from that aspect. And then somewhere along the line, I got interested in uh, doing airbrush again when I started watching people like uh, Ron, uh, Ron somebody. Uh, he's since passed away. His and uh, there's a, another fellow that's taken over from uh, from him, and I think it's a relative that's uh, actually selling stuff at the the uh, stairs. Uh, another one that is doing it is uh, that's becoming more popular locally. And I say locally, that's the United States because he moved from England to uh, Georgia because that's where Chroma, his sponsor, has wanted him to live. And that's Nick Agar. And uh, he does a little bit more that's out of the box uh, type of stuff uh, as far as that's concerned. The other one that does was doing it was uh, the fellow that did the uh, basket works that passed away. He started to go into airbrush uh, work out of Colorado. Uh, and then the, the one that got the biggest dollars for his pieces was Ben Fo from Vietnam. Now the key issue is why do some of these pieces sell and why do some of them sell with such a price? I mean, because anybody can take and slop color onto a piece of wood, and say, yeah, it's colorized. Uh, ben had a story. And his bowls reflected the story of his life and his escape from Vietnam. So it was kind of interesting from that aspect. And he had some interesting challenges uh, that he went through. I have, and I'm going to go through, if you had a chance to come up and take a look at what I had here, the reason why I wanted you to do that is it's easier to do that than to This is the bottom of the line. Bottom of the line, your friend and mine, Harbor Freight. This is back when this was like $18. And it uh, expands up on the list that I have here, ranging from $18. The new one that Harbor Freight has, which I haven't seen yet, is now $30 to a high-end uh, Iwata. Now, Iwata carries the Nero, Neoban, or Neo style for about $69. And this is a good gun. From there, we go up to close to six. I have used a $1,400 uh, SATA but I couldn't hardly see the line when I got done. 
it's, it's that fine. Uh, so what I want to get into now will be the uh, quick presentation, and I'm going to go through and point out a lot of these things to you. Well, that's always a good one. People who know me know I have questions about YouTube. Uh, look into the safety of it as far as the material safety data sheets. I use alcohol-based dyes. Uh, I do not use stains. Uh, so you should understand your product before you you start using it. Uh, stains, which are out there are popular. That works fine, but it doesn't work for airbrushing. The reason being, stains have fillers in them. And the filler will take and coat the surface and seal the wood up, and you don't go any further than that. Uh, the dyes that I use will uh, penetrate. I've got there are water-based dyes, there are some oil-based dyes, and there are alcohol-based dyes. Now, the one in the yellow and black box is an oil-based dye, and it's made for shoe leather. And it's a marine black, and it is the blackest black that I've ever seen in my life. But it will follow the grain of the wood, and it, if you put something on the side, it'll follow those pores down and come out at the end of those pores on a curve. Or if you do the inside, it, do the bottom, it'll come all the way through. It'll, it'll creep through. Uh, Mohawk is one of the brands that I buy uh, mine from uh, because I can buy a quart bottle for less money, and they have a pretty good selection of what they are uh, from that aspect. You can also use, like, uh, India ink. Okay, now that we know what we've we're going to put on it's going to be an alcohol based dye what we're going to use is an airbrush there are two types of airbrushes the first one being a single action where you don't have as much control you push that button and it starts to move both air and paint at the same time all of mine are the double action type so that if you push down you get air and you pull the trigger back you get paint and what's nice about that is if you get too much paint in a certain area, you can go back to the air and push it around. And then we'll get into the types, types of feeds. Siphon feed comes off of the type where the barrel or, or tube is at the bottom. And I will go back over this when I uh, get back to the uh, applying the uh, finish. The other is a gravity feed, which I prefer. And my favorite is a side feed. Gives you the best of both worlds. Because one, if I'm working close with a fine, it takes that container that was in the center, which is in the center of your sight, as you look down that barrel, uh, and sets this off to the side so I can look down and see what I'm doing. Next thing is, most guns come with a three uh, millimeter. The cheapest one, which I have here of uh, Harbor Freight is a three and a half. And then from there, they're, they're all threes. And uh, my high end one down here is the two, uh, two millimeter. And the SATA I used was a 0.5, uh, which was a $1,400 airbrush not mine belonged to a fellow that used to live here that does custom vehicles okay you have a compressor because you or you need a compressor to make an airbrush work makes sense so do you go out and buy one you don't have to look here see this but can you hear this you know for you out in Zoom land, I just turned on my my uh, airbrush compressor, and you can hardly hear it run. 
But that's not to say that you can't take the same fittings that you would have on your air hose and tie it off of your large pick shop compressor and run it through a uh, filter and a pressure reducer and feed that back to your airbrush. Okay. Now the next thing that's up is how do you protect the wood from what you don't want airbrushed? They make something called mask or masking. You can either tape it off and use paper to cover it, or you can use frisket, which is a brand name for a adhesive uh, tape, which is what I'll be using, and you'll see here in the in the future when I start masking off to do uh, some other pieces. Uh, stencils, you can either buy them commercially. I have probably three of the two and three inch three ring binders that are packed full and some that don't fit in the binders that are sitting on the side. Uh, you never know when you're gonna need one. Or you can turn around and actually buy the film, make your own stencil and go from there if you wanna use a stencil. Final thoughts? Practice before coloring. Uh, for you, those in Zoom land, you'll see that I have, an, and I'll show you here shortly, a practice easel behind me. And uh, I will spray on that to see what happens first. Uh, patience, it may save a turning by doing the other work. Have a positive attitude. You can do this. I don't care who you are to some extent or another. Yeah. And then David Pyle and Britt Turner both said a small difference makes all the difference in the world. So if you think that it's good, but if you did a little bit more, it'd be better. It's worth it. And Raff and Keys basically made a statement on finishing. When you get down to the finishing it, think about what you're going to do and use a sample piece first uh, because a poor finish on a, on a turning is nothing more than just a poor turning. Uh, credit references, it's uh, coloring uh, different books, Jan Sanders, great wood finishes for, for wood turners, woodworkers, great wood for, uh, finishes, and hand applied finishes by both, both by Jeff uh, Jewett are excellent books. Uh, product shows and demonstrations. Okay, now what happens? You got all this stuff, you get your ideas and opinions. Some of these are mine. Uh, how did I learn? TAE, trial and error, swag, scientific, wild guess, and ouch, you know. You know, I've had some expensive pieces of maple that didn't turn out the way I wanted. You know, when you're doing a piece of furniture and you're expecting to get that grain to totally pop and you're using a die to... Uh, bring that out and you're sanding it back, but it didn't work or it bled or it did, didn't turn out to be the color that it's supposed to have been. And then you have to go spend another $400 for a piece of wood. Not fun. Question was, do I test my colors on a sample piece first? Yes. Uh, because if I change colors and I'm using the mahogany, if I put a red on there, it doesn't come out as the same color red as you'd expect to see on a white sheet of paper. John, I'd like to go back where you were talking about uh, using alcohol dyes and using a water filter next to the uh, the gun that you're using. What's the visual effect of water vapor when you're using alcohol dyes on the on the paper that you're or on the piece that you're spraying? This has this has a filter right here just before it goes into the hose. Now, if you're using a compressor that's in your shop, you should have a filter one before it goes in the hose and you should have a filter just before it comes out and goes into your tool. 
even if you're using a, a wrench or an impact wrench or a pneumatic tool, you should be filtering that. But you don't feel that there needs to be a filter, a second filter on a portable rig? I haven't had, I haven't done that much for long periods of time. In Phoenix, my filter, my final filter set right here. Moisture. Well, it, it, if you get droplets coming out, it creates a fisheye effect. It doesn't give you a good finish. I've noticed uh, the colors there is a lot of dark colors and uh, the tinting. So if you wanted a lighter color, can you dilute it? And if you do, what do you dilute it with? This is a standard colors that would come from the kit from craft supply, yellow, orange, red, green, blue, black, denatured alcohol. These people also make this in a water-based. Now what happens when you put water on wood? You raise the grain, another reason why I use alcohol. Now I could take these uh, demonstration pieces that we'll get to and spray them with denatured alcohol and then hurry things up, flash them with a, take my cigarette lighter and flash them and make it look real fancy. Jimmy Clues, thank you. Yeah, Jimmy Clues, and he shows, he'll, he'll do a finish, which is the first thing I'll show you here. And he flashes that off so it's done quicker. Also, it shortens the grain down. So if you're interested in doing anything like this, the first people that came up doing this did it years and years and years ago. And there's evidence of, of this type of stuff being done eight to 10,000 years ago, where they would actually take the paint or mineral deposits or blood, put it in their mouth and spray it through the hollow, a hollowed out bone. So that goes back way, way, actually before my time. Yeah. So the next thing that came along was, is uh, Gary Frank's favorite tool, the mouth atomizer, which he uses. Mouth atomizer. I don't get a whole big thrill out of taking my head and putting it that far from a moving object. Along comes John with his flexible hose that I can now get away from it and do it. Although this takes a lot more air to push it than that does. What I have found and I like about this is I'll do a real hard puff and you get a good splatter pattern. Uh, there's another way of doing it with an airbrush uh, off of a pellet nut, off of a, a tongue depressor, and you let it build up and you spray it off from that way. But I like, the, this is easier. First thing I'm gonna do is, what color do we wanna make this? Oh, first thing we gotta do is figure out how to use an airbrush. And airbrushes this stuff is dye. It will stain anything and everything. That's the reason for having a holder for it. The reason for having this is it's a practice piece. So there's a couple of things you should do as as time goes on. One is Learn to control them. Now, I recently did a class. Hurt, Kirk to here. Yeah, I, I never heard a mention in the two days about the fact that you're using an airbrush, not an aerosol can. 
And when we came to the hands-on, most of the people were painting with an aerosol can. What do the instructions of an aerosol can say? About 12 inches away. Six, nine, 12. So if I'm trying to do this, what a mess. That's not a brush. A brush would give you a finer line or more of a point. So now this is with a number three needle. So if I go to a two, it gets to be finer. You go to a 0.5, you can be even finer and close up. But if you control that, the air pressure on this is about 30 pounds, which I would have to reduce down to get down to hairlines. But the point is, what I'm saying is, you want to learn to create a steady hand of dots. Now, that sounds great, but now I need to connect those dots. Now, I want it to fade out. So you pull out. So it becomes a, a multitasked type of thing. Now, what would happen if you take a, a brush, a paintbrush, you can turn sideways and still get a certain amount out of it. This, it'll start to get weird. And the closer you are, you get that airbrush pattern coming off of it. Now this is a gravity feed gun where the cup is on top, it's not siphoning below. If it had a siphoning below, the jug would be here and it gets in the way when you try to get up close. Now the next step is, is you want to do what they call uh, uh, swords or knives where you start and you create that pattern that way. And then you learn to come from in that direction. And your hand gets steadier and steadier if you get, keep practicing. Tool rest now becomes an arm rest. There you go. You're getting sleepy. But I can get that down to just a real fine line by getting it in there closer or by coming out further. Do you see where I have various levels of darkness on my color? I can come back in here. And sometimes it's kind of like watching grass grow. But the, the advantage of using an airbrush as opposed to using a rattle can is I don't have a whole lot going in the center that I'm trying to protect. Now, sometimes I might just want to take a look at where I am, what I've got, see what happens here. What is the purpose of uh, spraying while the lathe is stopped as opposed to when it's running? Uh, well, I wanted to concentrate the color here 
as opposed to all the way around. Because what I wanted to do was sand this back. And if it's got a highly, if it's relatively highly figured, it will make that just pop. And doing it by hand, something I usually don't do. But I didn't want to blow dust all over the place. So okay, you, you get the idea that you can come back in and sand that in that manner. And if that grain would all pop through there, you'd leave this darker so that fades and graduates into the shade. <clears throat> and then you would have the tone of grain in here. In, in this section through here would be enhanced where you see the grain here with these thin lines. This becomes a darker blue line and just en enhances. That's the object behind it. And if you don't like that color, what you do is you can clean it out. And when you clean things out, they have what they call, I guess, clean out jars. It works pretty good. I've tried taking a pop bottle, putting a hole in it, putting a t-shirt over the top. And as you spray it in, you can watch the colored vapors come through the t-shirt. So this works much better. The next thing I'll get into showing you is the Templates. Now, when I make my templates, I use that frisk, which is a contact paper, and I use the, which comes in two types, low and high uh, tack or stick, and I use high tack. Now, what I'm doing is cleaning this out, and I'm just blowing that down in there. Now... If I want to clean that out again, I put my finger over the end and it bubbles up on the inside and cleans out some more. And it marks up the lathe. Usually, if you're doing a multiple colored piece, which we'll do over here in a moment, uh, I will start with the lightest color. And when I get done, I just keep adding the colors to it and finish with the darkest one at the end, which makes a whole lot more sense. But I wanted you to be able to see what I was doing here and had hopes of that that green showing up better than it did. I would let that thing dry and go on and do whatever. So if I'm making a stencil, I have multiples of that doesn't show up against that very well. Uh, multiple stencils of this type of stuff, and you can get these at any of the uh, craft places. Hobby Lobby, Michaels, Joann's, different ones. If you really want an exotic set of them, uh, look up airbrushing and automotive. And there's tons of them out there, but the price also uh, jumps to like $25 to $50 a stencil. So I will take these and a fine point black marker. And I put it on that 
frisk that I talked about. So I'll put it on the frisk, and then while I'm sitting watching TV, I have small cutting board underneath so that I just sit this on my lap, take an X-Acto blade, and go around each one of these and cut them out. And it doesn't take that all that long to do. Let's see, I got... There's one 30-minute TV program, you know, so it's it's not that long. However, I did just invest in a laser cutter to see if I can get it to cut these for me. So you can do that, or you can take and just lay the existing stencil on and but you can't wrap around what i have found is a lot of people are stenciling and it's only here on the surface well that leaf if you have a leaf on there that leaf needs to roll all the way around doesn't happen we're going to do a sun sun burst bowl what color should I start with first, the black or the what, yellow? Okay. Now at home, I'll take a have this cloth hanging here. And I generally will come over and dab it, or in this case, I just want to make sure that's coming out clean. And it really isn't. That's better. And I can just sit here and work this back and forth. Multiple coats. See how I did that? You want it darker? Can you see the difference there where it's a deeper yellow? In my shop at home, if I'm working in it on this stuff, I'll use my large compressor simply because it's piped to the where I'm working. And I like to give that a little bit of time to, to dry, but not a whole lot. And I can just filter my way back in there and graduate it into the center as far as I want to go. And occasionally I'll stop and see if it's doing what I kind of expect it to. Got too much in there that time. 
It goes brown. I don't want to. Okay, I've got red in there, and I started to reach for the green, and I decide against it. Why? If I put the green over the red, what could I end up with? Brown. I don't, didn't want the brown stripe in there. I'm going from yellow to red. So if I go in there with a blue, I should end up with what? Now I kind of go over here and well, let's see, I'll shoot it from here because it's I will play around like this line when I'm at the end and I'm waiting for that to dry just to see what I can do. That starts to get pretty fine and that's a three millimeter needle. And you start building up with, with those and you basically create the hairs of an animal or, or whatever. And then if you wanted the splatter pattern in there, you take a tongue depressor and you set the tongue depressor like there and then you spray the fluid onto the your tongue depressor and it splashes off. Or you go to the other form. Well, that's going around. I'm gonna do a little brush cleaning here. When you were doing the spray and then you said you used a flame, what did that do with it? All he's doing is burning off the balance of the alcohol that's, that's still there wet. And what what kind of effect does it There's no effect. It just dries it. Oh, okay. It's, I thought it did a pattern or something. No, no. No, it's just a... Because he, you know, he'll actually spray at first, and then he flashes it off, which, you know, with, with, with this, and you... Know, you and it goes up and it's quick. And then he takes 320 sandpaper and goes over it one more time or 400 one more time. And the grain is raised and it's kind of burned down and it's clean, but it's a clean piece of wood to go from. When I was talking about if you had a burl like the piece that uh, you brought in in maple in a bowl that's fairly light, it does it, the pattern is there, but it doesn't have the dark uh, separations in the lines. If you go over that with a yellow or an orange lightly and then sand that back or even dilute it down and then sand that back, it will make that grain just pop. Like what you did with in, in that particular piece of wood, all you needed was the, the finish on there. Uh, how many people buy figured lumber in here? All right, yeah, a number of them. How many of you spray it with water at the store before you take it out the door and buy it? None of you. How do you know what you have? You may have just bought a $200 board and have $50 worth of wood. A good wood place will have a bottle of water. And if they're smart, it's distilled water. And I will take a spray bottle, a little atomizing bottle, and I will spray it and see what that grain does. And if that grain pops, you'll know what you have when you put a finish on it. If it doesn't pop, don't spend $200 for that board that they're telling you is figured. But you can enhance that by doing this and sanding back the finish, like I tried to do here, but it was not being cooperative. And this is not particularly fancy wood. This is hard maple. Okay. You know that I take my clipboard with my self-healing cutting mat underneath and 
I'm throwing stuff everywhere, aren't I? Self-healing mat. And I'll take, during while I'm watching a TV program, and I'll take and work this around these edges in order to create the pattern I want or copy the line. So the idea now is to take this, and these are numbered. Can you see? If you can see, these are numbered, number three and number three. The reason being is when I cut this out of here, what I'm going for, if I want to put a leaf on there, am I going for the center or I'm going the outside? I'm going for the outside. And yes, I do try to keep this stuff together because by using what is referred to as high tack, one, I can't get it apart, and two, you can reuse it if you can find an edge somewhere and hopefully you can get a corner to lift aha and you peel that off carefully in case yeah I've also had these where I cut, was cutting on a leaf and found out, oh, I only cut one half of it. And then you're sitting here trying to figure out why it doesn't come up. No, I haven't had that trouble yet. Well, I'll tell you, the show is more interesting regardless of what it is than watching Working your working your knife around one of these leaves. Now I could be like David Nittman, who was one of the turners I was going to talk about. When he did his airbrush demo, he said, Now that you've all seen how it's done, I want you to buy my products, but I don't want anybody to do what I do. Because he makes a living at it. Yeah. Or the other way of doing this is to, uh -huh. well, we'll see what happens. Then you take the stencil, which is going to be the outer edge of it, and Kind of drop it into place, sort of. Yeah, well, I guess that's where it's going to be, seeing how that's where it went down. And if you're sloppy, which I evidently was on my corners, you're fighting with it to get it off. All right. You're just going to be totally difficult for me. So I'll do it that way. So you kind of line up that mark, maybe. Ah. The last time I did this, it worked perfect. Ah. So now I've got that down, I'm gonna make that a little bit more permanent on the outside. Now, for those of you who went to or have watched some of the other people that teach doing this stuff, 
they will talk about, with a couple of exceptions, they will talk about once that pattern is on, they come back and just splatter colors around. You know. Sometimes when I do this, I don't even bother to put it back in the lathe because I'm going to hit it with color. And I will actually use a stand and just hold it up that holds it up in this position. Can, can you see so that's uh, that? Or I'll mount it back on the lathe and I'll go back in and just do the... Uh, coloring in that area. Large bottles of who's that? Mohawk. This is a life life, you know, this will last me a lifetime. This this go around and maybe even the next. Now a maple leaf is all just plain one color, right? For those out in Zoom land, when I asked that question, the, the, some heads in the audience were bobbing up and down. Those may have been dozing off, which is okay. And others were going horizontally left to right saying, no, they're not all one color. So once again, we'll go back and we'll start with our yellow. And I don't need much. So I, I've just kind of filled in a little bit with yellow in some areas where I might want it a little darker yellow. I'm coming back in and putting a second coat. Now this is where if you're not creative or remember what a maple leaf looks like, go outside and pick one up in color and bring it home and keep it in a folder for yourself or laminate it in some plastic so you can go back and take a look at it. And you'll notice I'm only about two inches from the from my work surface. I'm not I'm not out here spraying it. The class I was at uh, with Dean, I was watching everybody. They were using it like it was they're using a spray can from 12 inches away, trying to do patterns like this. They had their lathes. Of course, they were brand new lathes that were on loan from. from uh, Timbers, where the demonstration was at. But you think we get a discount on those lathes after the fact? No. So from there, we we'll go into maybe a little richer color. Maybe. And so you could do this and you had TV on, you could watch Three Stooges at the same time. And generally, you'll find one side of the leaf seems to go sooner than the other. And I haven't figured out why, but Maybe a little bit on the tips, and that's about it. I could do that, and I'll let it dry just a little bit. Now I could turn around and take, like, this hairline here and try to put that in by hand using that airbrush to get those veins in. Or, if you're smart, you get yourself a number O brush or number one. Number one round brush.
So you got to get the sizing out of it. And normally I'd rotate this around where it'd be easier for me to to do it than it is trying to come back from here. And you now have your stems in there. And if you don't like the coloring of it because it's sitting there for a while, you notice it's gotten lighter. It's actually gotten a little bit lighter. So I can actually turn around at this point and think about, well, what do I want to do? Maybe I'll add just a little bit more yellow, followed by a little bit more red, and run that process again. The question was, will I put a finish coat over the top? Yes, which will be lacquer. starting to spray at an angle and not where I want it. But you get the idea of, of what you do. And basically, you just go on and on and on. So the next step from this would be is you take this off, you take the piece that was in the center and put it over it. Then you take this one and relocate it somewhere else, which now gives you uh, this leaf either looks like it'll be over the top of this one or this one will be over the top of that one, depending upon how it's done, which is almost uh, creating like a Oh, when you shoot the color. Carol. Yeah, negative, negative space. That's what it was looking at. You can almost create it like a negative space painting. So you end up building that. The uh, blue platter that you've seen at the sale that sits there at the sale forever and ever that uh, nobody has bought yet, although that's the only piece of airbrushing I still have left. Uh, and I know why. But that's very much similar to a negative space because it's overlapping. And then I, when I got done, I went and masked all of them and then did the blue background to create the effect of them floating on water in theory. Well, I still have my theory from that aspect. The ones that I have done that were not with the blue background, but strictly the leaves What do we got here? Looks like I didn't get all the stencil picked up. Yeah. Huh. But you get, you see the effect that you get, and you actually can see at this point the good blending that you have between these colors and that. This is older stencil material. That might be part of my problem. So that's kind of the way things are done. And then basically at this point, I have found if I, you know, covered this and did, some, you know, put in three to five leaves, never one, never, never two, never four. You want an odd number. Don't ask me why, but it's whole truth for everything. An odd number. And so I do either three, I might do three here and then two overlapping here. When I did plates like that, they'd be gone in, in a heartbeat. So, and they're a whole lot easier than that other one I did because that other one had 100 hours in. You know, when I say 100 hours, I mean, that's from the time, yeah, let's do this. I put the blank on, turn the blank, 
and then started going and then to the time that the finish I had finished it completely from start to finish it was a hundred hours but that was that was mask remask and remask and remask any questions question was does the art store in Phoenix have, or not Phoenix, in Prescott have a lot of this stuff. They used to carry the Grex, which is the airbrush that I am using in, in, in like, or, uh, you know, it's, they used to carry that. They don't anymore. Hobby Lobby has a couple of Iwata if they have them in stock for about $70. Uh, the art store has the uh, alcohol dyes. In this, they also have one that's metallics. They also have one that's something else. So it's kind of interesting from that aspect. I went online and looked at, at what was available. Uh, Creative Mark, which is Jerry's out of online or out of Phoenix, carries one called Creative Mark. That is the only brush that I have ever bought and took back because it's such a piece of junk. It did not meet the quality of Harbor Freight. Oh, yeah. No, it was. And when I took it into them, they couldn't do anything with it either. So stay away from that one. Grex, uh, Iwata are probably the, the top of the line. Badger, I used a Badger. I've got one Badger. I don't care for it either. Uh, and then I had some Pache which are just single action from way back when I was doing photo retouching and that uh, locally there isn't much available. There's two, there's like a coast airbrush or Pacific airbrush and Chicago airbrush that carries a whole line of all stuff. And you can spend a fortune on stencils at either one of them uh, from that aspect. And in Phoenix, the art, Arizona Art Supply, probably has the best selection of airbrushes in the state, as far as that's concerned. So the art store uh, in Prescott, that's the one on 6th Street? Yeah. Okay. He used to carry, he used to carry the, uh, he does have uh, the atomizers for about 12 or $13, I think. Uh, minus the hose, the uh, visible difference in Flagstaff carries Badger, a limited line of it, but the uh, Arizona Art Supply at 16th Street and Indian School, southeast corner, uh, which is just across the street from Luke's Italian Beef, which is pretty decent. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you like Chicago style Italian beef, has the best supply of airbrushes and associated equipment and a good s assortment of stencils as well. The art store, by the way, um, offers a 10% discount to Prescott area wood turners. Um, if you just mention Prescott area wood turners, um, you get it. Yeah, if you're, if you're buying your dyes or something like that from them, if you're just getting into it. For thirty bucks, I would buy the gun from Harbor Freight, because while you're by while you're there, you can get a pressure regulator, and you can get the regular fittings that go on regular air hoses, and tie them off with the compressor that you have. Harbor Freight, Ace Hardware, Harbor Freight. I stick this on, stick two guns in at a time. Good to go. Uh, you run at 30? Hmm? You run at 30 pounds? Well, for this one, I am. Sometimes, if I want to make this line finer, I'll back it down. But I rarely go under about 15 to 20. Because the size of this, if I wanted a finer line, I'd go to the end brush. And it's, but when you go to the finer line and the, and the finer needle, that needle is... is, is is actually fragile and the uh, 
like I said, I used that SATA that had the 0.5. I was allowed to practice on a piece of something because he was using it for his, his the motorcycle he was doing, putting custom paint job on. I had a chance to use it. That was it. That was beyond what he allowed me to touch that gun. And I wanted no part of it, any of it, because a 0.5 is, you know, I mean, it's, that line is, is a quarter of the thickness of this. If you could picture a, a picture of a wolf, and this is what he was doing. He was putting a wolf on the side of a Harley Davidson. He was putting the hairs in with it one by one by one, fading them. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for John? I am available. I'm on the vendors list. You know how to get a hold of me. If you have any questions and you you want to do it because you can, don't tell me you can't because I won't accept that as an answer. Uh, I can't is not in my vocabulary. So I will be available to help you with it. Uh, the same with goes with most anything in turning, except for segmented. I will leave the segmented to those that have that mentality. Uh, because that takes a breed of a special type, as far as I'm concerned. Although here I am, I'm talking about doing this and having 100 hours in it. So I guess it's just, you know, a different flavor. Well, I think the people that do the illusion stuff is a special breed. I I haven't done that. And I, I don't know if I will, but that's a very special talent there. So. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes our meeting. I bid you farewell until next time.